we've been looking at 1 Timothy, and as we looked at that, we thought that we would encounter a couple of big issues that we'd have to stand aside for a bit and look at. And one of those is the issue of false teachers. And we see, before we look at that, let's ask the Lord's blessing. Lord, please open to us uh, 1 Timothy and help us to understand the, the sort of false teachings that were circulating in the world that day and, and uh, how uh, they might still be imp uh, have implications going down to today. So open our eyes to see and to trust in your word as, as the, the solution to false teaching. Amen. So we see that at the beginning of 1 Timothy, verses 1 to 3, and Paul says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may what? So you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. For such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. And last week we talked about how to rightly interpret the Bible and we were reminded that letters like this one that Paul wrote to 1 Timothy were written for a particular person, for a particular time, for a particular place because something was going on there. And if we interpret Scripture best, we try to find out what was going on, what was happening at the time. And so we can so find some clues about that in 1 Timothy, about the kind of false teaching that was around at that time. And the first which we just saw in there is a devotion to myths and endless genealogies. And I wonder if that sort of makes any sense to you. What are they talking about? Myths and endless genealogies. That's part of the false teaching. And then we'll just pick out a couple of bits of 1 Timothy to see other aspects. There's myths and genealogies. What have we got in chapter 4, verse 1? The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And you go, whoa, things taught by demons. That needs some unpacking, doesn't it? So it's possible to be led astray from dem demonic forces because Satan can masquerade as an angel of light. And things that can appear good can actually be quite wrong. Oh. And in the next verse, we see some false teachers who are just what you would call low, low humanity. Hypocrites, liars and seared consciences. That's in verse 2 there. Some such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. So you get those type of guys in the mix. And we can also see from verse 3 that the false teaching was forbidding people to abstain from things which God created as good, to, to abstain from marriage and, and certain foods. And in chapter 4, verse 7, God's, uh, Paul's going to mention godless myths again, and he's going to then add, as well as the godless myths, there's old wives' tales. Those are things we might call like urban legend or... Superstition, and superstition is just sort of fear on steroids, fear making wild leaps of logic. It says in verse 7 there, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. And then Paul finishes the chapter of chapter 4 with a reminder of how the life that you live should match the message you preach. And, you know, we've heard that in church many times. But he's actually saying that for a particular reason, to confront false teaching in that time, that how you live is important because they are a bit more into how you feel on the inside is important. But he's saying, no, how you live is important. And it says that in chapter 4, verse 16, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Put them together. Chapter 6 has got some more characteristics of false teachers. First of those is that they're unwilling to agree with the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, which Paul's been passing on. So it says in verse 3 there of chapter 6, If anyone teaches otherwise and doesn't agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited. And what do they understand? Nothing. And so 
Another aspect of false teachers is they don't like to submit their ideas to what the Bible says. And then they love to argue. In the second half of verse 4, they have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words. You've seen people who are argumentative? What's the result there? And the result is envy and strife and malicious talk and evil suspicions. And I love this next bit. And constant friction between people. Constant friction between people of corrupt mind who've been robbed of the truth and who think, and here's a new idea, that godliness is a means of financial gain. Well, those are clues sprinkled through 1 Timothy about what the situation was that he was speaking to. And as I researched for today's message, I became gradually aware of how many of the false teachings of those days are still around. They're still influencing the church today. And I wondered, what was their source? Where did they come from? And I think their source is right back at the very beginning, at the fall of man. Let's go and look in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Well, the woman says, Yes, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you mustn't eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you mustn't touch it or you'll die and the serpent says ah oh, you will not certainly die god knows that when you eat it your eyes will be opened and you'll be like god knowing good and evil and when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food man pleasing to the eye and also was desirable for gaining wisdom she took some and she ate it and she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it and then then the eyes of the both of them were open and they realized they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves and so the crafty serpent is at work bringing in false teaching at the very beginning of the history of mankind. It starts right back there. Consider this about that situation, the context. Firstly, God makes everything, right? So you know that if someone makes something, a maker, when he makes it, he knows everything about it. He knows because he made it. And then along with it comes a set of operating instructions. And if you read those instructions and you work it according to that, what do you get? Success. And so here is God, the maker. He makes mankind. He gives Adam and Eve, along with that, a set of operating instructions for how, can they, how they can live a successful life. And all is good until the serpent comes along and deceives And like many false teachers, he doesn't directly contradict what God has said. He just adds a little bit more information. And what's he doing here? He's going around the back of the man and he's trying to subvert the way God set it up, God's channel of authority, and goes to the man's bone of my bones, his helper, with his deception. And it's not that she's more gullible, really. It's just that he's trying to subvert the way God does things. He's trying to go a different way around. And he comes around with a promise of secret knowledge. Verse 5 there, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And it's like he's plugged into a secret paranoia. You know, God's holding back some knowledge from you. And both men and women like that idea, secret or hidden knowledge. And they ate. And they found that with that knowledge came self-awareness, came self-consciousness. And they realised their nakedness and they realised the vulnerability of that. 
of what they realized they were exposed. And then they began the process of covering up and hiding away, which has plagued relationships ever since, hasn't it? We're all hiding and covering up parts of ourselves that are vulnerable and we don't want to see, I don't want people to see. And this knowledge is not just general knowledge, but it's knowledge that they thought would enable them to be like God. And what does it mean to say to be like God? It essentially means that you will then be your own God. You'll be your own God. And it's knowledge about power, isn't it? And it seems that people have been using knowledge to maintain power over us ever since. What do governments do when they funnel and control the information that goes out into the public? To control the people. At the individual level, it seems people have been wanting to release their own inner power ever since through knowledge to connect with their own inner goddess or God. So before we go any further with that idea, I think we should acknowledge how self-centred it is that something which has been produced, been made, a product, wants to rewrite the operating instructions that came from the maker. How self-centred is it that people would want to rewrite God's operating instructions to us. And I want to shout out to people like that who want to live according to their own code and say, did you give yourself life? Which one of us here gave ourselves life and therefore has the, the authority to write our own operating instructions? None of us. The one who made us alive is the one who knows how we work best and how ridiculous to think that you know better than one who gave you life, made you alive. But the serpent seems to have plugged into something deep when he says, you won't die, you'll know really special stuff that God's been keeping from you. And ever since Adam and Eve yielded to that temptation and suffered the consequences of God's punishment, Mankind has struggled with living in a fallen and imperfect world, hasn't he? And, and from trying to make sense of this fallen and imperfect world have arisen many of the philosophies and the, is, the isms of the world and, and many of them are just following the serpent's deceptive promise that there's a special knowledge. And you have that. You get to be like God. You get to be basically God yourself. In Paul's letter to Timothy, there were two big false teachings circulating. One was from the Judaizers and one was what we call early Gnosticism. And the one which is carried on and influences us mostly is Gnosticism, which is what we're going to think about this morning. And Gnosticism, what's that? It's got a silent G in front of it, Gnosticism. It's a sort of generic term because there are many different brands of it and it's sort of the overall description of people doing things in those days and comes from a Greek word, gnosis, which means knowledge. It's about knowledge. I was, uh, uh, oh, that's the power. <laughs> the holy knowledge of the Lord. <laughs> he knew we needed to pause there. Yes, a secret knowledge. There are probably uh, several reasons why people feel dissatisfied with just what the Bible says, the plain teaching. But the people like who are, are the Gnostics who are, they're either just intellectually dissatisfied with that message of the Bible and the Gospel. I had an uncle who said, oh, that's just too simple. Uh, or they might be emotionally dissatisfied with plain truth and say, well, look, I want something a bit more emotionally connected. I want something, I want a transcendent spiritual experience. That's what you should have. Or well, some people just don't like to be told what to believe, do they? They don't want to be told. They want to make up their own mind. And Gnostics still exist today. There are multiple un online gateways to their teachings. And you know, in the public spiel, field, books like the Da Vinci Code, that's based on Gnosticism, Films like The Matrix, that's strongly Gnostic. 
They've got these people who in general are just offended by what the Bible says. They're offended by anything from it. And back in Timothy's day, as they're looking at the grim realities of life in this fallen world, they came up with their own explanation of why things were as they were. Now before we look at their explanation, let's just remember what the Bible says. There's only one God. He created it all. And what, it, what was it like? 2 verse 31, God saw all that he was made and it was very good. So hold that in our thoughts. As far as we're concerned, God made it very good. And he's still intimately involved with it. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground without him knowing. See that in Matthew. Are two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. But since the fall, we know the world has been beset by suffering. There's suffering, there's evil. And even creation itself groans under a curse. See that in Romans. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. That's Romans 8, 22. But the source of that, why is this so? It's man's sinful rebellion against God. It's not the physical world itself. See, God is sustaining our world in his common grace. And creation is just showing how great he is. Psalm 19, the heavens are declaring. We look out there, the heavens declare. What do they declare? Uh, not Mother Nature. They declare the glory of God. And the skies are proclaiming the work of his hands. And God's power and God's beauty, wisdom and his beauty can be seen there in those things. According to Romans, 1 verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his power, his eternal power, his divine nature, they have been clearly seen. They've been understood from what's been made so that people are without excuse. And the Christian's hope, our hope, is a physical one as well as a spiritual one, that one day God will usher in the new heaven and the new earth. So that's what we know from the scriptures. What about the Gnostics? Well, because they can't conceive that they might be the problem, they can't consider that, we can't be the problem. So they think, oh, the physical world, that has to be a mistake. It has to be a work of a bad or a stupid God. And, and in fact, they came up with a name for him, but the Demiurge. And he's got to be really way down the hierarchy of gods, you know. He can't be the real thing. That's the God of the Old Testament. And he's the one to blame for making this world evil and full of suffering. And, and so somewhere way behind him, there's got to be a beautifully perfect and a holy God called the Pleroma, the fullness. And flowing from this God up here, there's sort of emanations. So that along the way, they have a variety of lesser godlike entities and rulers and then way down the end you've got Sophia wisdom and she has a child which is uh, uh, the demiurge the savage god of the old testament and we're going to blame him because he created this turbulent and bad world that's what, they, that's what they came up with in those days and they believe that this visible world therefore it's bad or it's meaningless no wisdom no truth in it because the real world is not this the real world is that spiritual reality way back behind it well how do you get saved how do you get saved well we know from the bible let's remind ourselves of the bible first because that's the truth the other is speculation the bible says that we all need to be redeemed to be brought back from the consequences of that fall of man you know romans 3 23 how many have sinned and fall short of the glory all of us and what were we? We were slaves in Romans 6. We were slaves to sin. And we were free from the control of righteousness. And in Ephesians, back set up, remember, you are separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You were without hope. You didn't have God in the world. That's the situation. But what did God do about it? He gave his son to save us, sinners like us. 
Jesus' perfect life and his sacrificial death and his glorious resurrection enable us to be saved if we put our trust in him. Romans tells us that very clearly, just as through the disobedience of the one man that we've read about in Genesis, the many were therefore made sinners. But through the obedience of the one man, Jesus, many will be made righteous, such that in Romans 8, there will now be no condemnation if we are in Christ Jesus. So salvation comes through faith in Jesus and not from looking deep within ourselves. Scripture is clear that the result of that faith is our souls will be saved. See in 1 Peter, the salvation of our souls, you're receiving the end result of your faith. What does your faith lead to? In other words, the salvation of your souls. And there's more than that. Our salvation is not only of our souls. Ultimately, we will be with Christ forever with new bodies, like his glorious body. See that in Philippians, who by the power that enables him to bring anything under his control will what? He'll transform our lowly bodies so that we'll be like his glorious body. Well, that's a great hope. And uh, therefore we'll be living with him with that body. In Revelation 21, I heard a loud voice around the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now amongst his people. He'll dwell with them and they'll be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. So that's physically living together. That's what we believe. That's what we know from the scriptures. What about the people, the, the Gnostics? They say, oh, no, no. We're trapped in our bodies and this material world. And then we need to escape. And we need to escape into a perfect, non-physical essence into spiritual reality and the way we're going to get there is by being enlightened we're going to have special knowledge about how to transcend this earthly body which of course only the clever people are going to get that or the people who really try really hard because if you work really hard at it you one day you're going to be one of the chosen few that can eventually escape the earthly realm into the realm of light after death And they say, we know that there's a spiritual world, a world because we've got a spark of the divine in us. And the path of salvation is to journey inwards to find that spark, to experience that spark, to embrace that spark and connect with your divine self. That's what they say. If you hear these things around, no, that's not what you believe from the scriptures. And that's... The sort of summary, a simple summary, it's an enormous topic, the simple summary of, of the, the thinking that was around and Paul saying, Timothy, deal with this thinking. And I think we just need to know something about it. So with, if you're like me and stuff's out there and people are saying things and you go, where are they coming from? This is where they're coming from. And so those myths and legends that Paul talked about they're the stories that these Gnostics came up with to spread their ideas. And endless genealogies that went with them, they, that's just a way of adding credibility to your message. You see, if you could trace back the lineage of who said this to somebody who was a real authority figure, you say, we're in that tradition, what we're saying is true. The problem was they were making up genealogies. They're going off to forges and, and people who could write up fancy documents. And, and these guys were making up stuff. It, you don't think fake news just started now, do you? Fake news started way back there. And what another big person in our, in our, our time is Carl Jung, who studied these writings extensively. In 1945, they found some ancient Gnostic writings and he went and studied them. And uh, now it's worth mentioning also that the Gnostics were really into having ecstatic religious experiences. They wanted transcendent emotional states and vivid inner journeys. And Jung believed that by studying those navel-gazing interior journeys and theories and the myths and stories of them of the Gnostics, he said, oh, that's a great way of, of uh, working out what the human condition is like. 
And he fed that into his theories of how the brains work uh, and came up with things that you'll say, uh, you might have heard of the collective unconscious. You might have heard of archetypes, types, ideas that are lurking in there. And so they're the type of myths which Paul was concerned about in Timothy. Alternative stories to the biblical story. And the fact that they're stories is actually interesting because the Gnostics were and still are more interested in a story than they are in a creed or a statement of faith. Because you see, when you read a story, you can feel it and you can come to your own meaning out of it. And it's the meaning that you find in the story which is more important than the actual story. And that's why in the early church they actually f worked very hard to come up with creeds and, uh, for example, the Nicene Creed, to combat the myths because there was an unending number of different theories, different stories, different myths which appealed to novelty and people's never-ending desire to have a special knowledge. Against that, what was the good teaching that they had in those days? Well, at this stage in the church's history, they had the teaching of the apostles which people had heard. They'd heard them speak, that they had direct transmission from uh, oral tradition and in this case they had Paul to ask the questions and if you think I preached for a long time I haven't yet preached as long as Paul who preached so long that a guy fell out of the window and <laughs> died and got brought back to life and then he carried on preaching but uh, they had that and they had the central body, body of knowledge from the apostles and that's why Paul says in Timothy verse 4, verse 13, until I come, devote yourself to that. And devote yourself to the public reading of the scripture because they had the Old Testament and to the teachings which have been passed on. And then, don't forget, 4, verse 16, put the, put the teachings together with your life. Watch your life and doctrine. Now, Let's just talk about how the implications of that Gnostic ideal which we see today around us. Because they said, you know, the body, it's part of the material world, and that means your body's actually contemptible. It's a worthless shell. It's imprisoning your true self because the precious spirit within, the divine spark within, that's who truly you. And your inner person is separate from and actually, your inner person is more real than your physical person. That's what they're saying. And, oh, what does that mean? Well, you can go two ways. You can say, oh, therefore I need to avoid contamination with this evil world. I need to stay away from it. And so you get a guy called Simon Stylites who lived on top of a pillar for 20 years so he wasn't contaminated by this world. Or you go the other way and say, oh, it's a hopeless task. I can never... Uh, to keep the body pure, so I'll just do whatever I like. I'll be as licentious as I like. And probably that first group of people were the ones who said, don't get married, don't indulge in the pleasures of the flesh because, you know, don't stay uncontaminated from the world. And 4 verse 3, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. Now, certain foods might also have been the Judaizers who are saying, look, you need to eat according to the Old Testament rules. Uh, so there's a bit of an over, overlap there. But friends, God didn't make our body a worthless, contemptible shell. Our bodies are intrinsic to us and they're designed in wisdom and love by our good creator to serve and glorify him. We have to say with Psalm 139, I praise you because why? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And yes, we know that uh, sin has tragically brought illness and death into the world from Romans. We know that as sin entered the world through one man and death came in through sin. And in this way, death came to all because you sinned. But, God, but our bodily life is nothing to be ashamed of. What's our body? The temple of the Holy Spirit. And we honour God with our bodies by living in obedience to him. 1 Corinthians tells us that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit is in you. You're not your own. And Philippians, I eagerly expect and await 
and hope that I'll in no way be ashamed, but I have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted. See, Christ exalted in our body. And far from being useless shells, the bodies of believers are going to, the bodies are going to be raised to new life. 1 Corinthians, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body, that's so imperishable, is raised imperishable. Amen. And Revelations 23, there's that imper imperishable body. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now amongst the people. That's phenomenal. God and us in the same place. He'll dwell with us. We'll have a new body for that. They will be his people and God himself will be there with them and be their God. And the Gnostics and the male-female issue, you know. In Genesis 1.27, we know we're created in the image of God, male and female. God deliberately made men and women different and interdependent, equal but not the same because there are X and there are Y chromosomes, biological reality. Each sex has its distinctive and complementary roles to play. What do the Gnostics think? Well, they reject any distinction between men and women because this is the useless bad creation, you know, and the ideal is androgyny, a synthesis of male and female, neither one nor the other. And the implication of this thinking ranges from goddess worship to saying women need to become men to be saved. You see, the common theme is that because it's all defective, male and female distinctions, they're defective too. They're just part of this fallen world. We've got to escape them if we want to try and true life. Quote from one of the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas says, when you make the male and the female one and the same, so that the male will not be male and the, the female females, then you will enter the kingdom. How different is that from the Gospel, from the Bible? But that's, what, that's where you get to if you reject the Bible. And then they move on from that to this gender identity thing because you say, now since the real you, that divine spark, is what you feel deep inside, your inner person can override all external factors, including objective biological reality. And so that means that the transgender movement can claim that gender identity doesn't necessarily align with birth sex. Because you look inside, you write your own script, whether that's male or female or some other option, regardless of your body. Because you see, how you feel on the inside, that can trump reality. Gnostics just may have an obsession that insists, insists there's something you could, unique about us and our experience. That's what makes us right. And then there's something addictively delicious and supportive about getting together with other like-minded people and demanding that everyone else accept that our experience is valid and true. Well, what's a Christian thing? If you consider that your living human body is insignificant and only the inner person is valuable, then the sanctity of human life is on shaky ground. To think that human worth should depend on something within, such as self-awareness or knowledge, the fruit of that is the assumption in medical ethics, is the assumption that a human being starts and stops being a full person based on their mental capacity. So an unborn person is not regarded as a person yet. An individual has dimension, is no, dementia is no longer a person. Do you see the danger of that for those people? The, what do we believe? Human life is uniquely precious. Because, not because of how we feel about ourselves, but because we are created in God's image. And our significance comes from that. Not from our quality of life, not from our age, not from our awareness or our capability. We are a person made in the image of God from conception onwards. Psalm 139, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Well, let's draw it together. 
Those false teachings which started way, way back are still around and the church has been battling them forever. And this Gnostic viewpoint sneaks in because it's often been closely linked with the church. Did you know that many Gnostics like Jesus? They say, well, he's one of those key people who showed us the way to higher knowledge and to illumination. He was probably the first Gnostic. That's what they say. And these guys say, well, although he was from the true God, he, he certainly, no, he couldn't be an equal with God. Well, he's probably not truly human. May have had a physical body or a container, but he, he certainly didn't die on the cross or rise from the dead. It, you know, he was a person just like us. And so we can do the same sort of things he did, or even greater, if we plug into the special knowledge and illumination which he had. It's rubbish, isn't it? Gnostics say the Bible, it contains truth, but it's not truth itself. By reading it, you have the, of course, you can read those stories and you have the possibility that you can connect with the spiritual reality behind those stories. That's what they say. And my hope is that by seeing how far back this goes, you can be encouraged to see how dynamic and how authoritative the Bible actually is and how it speaks to the things which this world is just being led astray to. That the, word, the Lord Jesus is the eternal God. He is the word who was in the beginning. It was with God and, and was God, and he really did become a man. And he could only take our place if he was a true and perfect man, and he can only rise again overcoming death because he was an almighty God. And only someone fully God and fully man could bridge that gap between God and us and be that perfect sacrifice for sin which paid the price owed by our sinfulness. So don't listen to the serpent's crafty invitation. Ooh, there's knowledge God hasn't told you. There's special knowledge. There's an awareness you need. You won't be saved by finding your own way to the inner you. You'll only be saved by finding Jesus' way. We didn't give ourselves life. Let's listen to the one who did, who is the way, who is the truth, who is the life. Will you pray with me? Lord, we like novelty, we like hearing new stuff. But let us never be drawn aside. Never be drawn aside in a way that takes us away from biblical truth that takes us away from the foundation revealed by you. And we want to, if we've been led astray by something, Lord, in this moment we want to come against us. If we've been thinking, that's an interesting thought. Hold on. It's about secret knowledge. It's about me discovering my inner godliness. No, there is one God. There is one way. And it is the Lord Jesus and his operating instructions. The problem is not in reality. The problem is in the sinfulness of mankind. And Jesus is the way past it, the way to overcome it, so that our body and our soul together, with a renewed body and soul, will be with you, our God in heaven, together. What a glorious hope. Praise be to God for giving us that opportunity. Hallelujah and amen.